there's ne really no need for any introduction for any of you, but anyway, I will say that Professor Susan Hack is a professor at the University of Miami, and the, she has made remarkable contributions in epistemology, logic, um, analytical philosophy of language, and in the last year, she has been working in uh, legal epistemology, and that's why she's been in Girona for the third or fourth time now. Mm -hmm. How many times you were here? Who knows? And who knows how many <laughs> more times she will be here with us? Uh, today she will speak about uh, causa uh, about sorry causation and correlation, the Bradford Hill criteria in epistemological context. Uh, more, more or less 45 minutes for okay. to speak and more uh, 45 minutes for discussion. Okay, in each panel it will be the same. Thank okay, uh, buenos dias. Uh, quiero uh, empezar agradeciéndoles a las organizadores por su trabajo y su invitación. Es, es siempre un placer estar aquí con mis amigos en Girona. Uh, no me atrevo a castigarles más con mi acento horrible. Uh, entonces, en inglés, um, I should first of all explain, I have a, I'm recovering from a broken wrist. So some of this paper was typed with one hand, and some of this paper was typed worse with one eye because I couldn't get my right contact lens in. So I apologize in advance for the typographical mistakes. Uh, however, my head, so far as I know, still functions adequately, I hope. Uh, all right. Um, for me, when I do legal philosophy, I always feel a certain tension. Um, because on the one hand, there is a temptation to, to rise to a very high level of abstraction at the price of saying nothing that engages in any detail with any specific legal system. Uh, that makes me very uneasy. Um, on the other hand, there's always Charybdis, if you've avoided Scylla. And the Charybdis, of course, is you tie your argument so closely to one specific legal system but it has no real bearing on any others. Um, I have never found this an easy tension to navigate, um, but I've chosen this time to navigate it in the following way. Um, the epistemological considerations I will be offering are all perfectly general and applicable to evidence uh, in whatever legal system, however it might be handled procedurally. But my examples will all come from US law, which is the system with which I have some familiarity. Um, despite my accent, I know a great deal more about Florida law, for example, than I do about English law. So, all right. Um, my paper opens, those of you who have read it will know, um, with a quotation from a novel by John Grisham, the king of torts. Um, not because I regard him as an authority on legal questions, um, but I suppose for two reasons. One is it's very funny, um, and this kind of work I think is very difficult, so in part I'm laughing to keep from crying. Um, but also because what he says contains just a tiny grain of truth, just enough that I think it's worth reminding you of the ugly side of mass tort litigation as it happens in the United States. Um, those of us who live there have probably all had the experience of you know, the surprise of receiving in the mail a check for a dollar and 30 cents, which is your share of the case that you didn't know you were part of against American Airlines for some kind of price gouging activity or whatever it is. Okay. Um, why do I have to laugh to keep from crying? Because when I began to explore the topic of mass torts, which was not something with which I was very familiar, I realized the complexities are simply overwhelming, um, in part because there are so many different kinds of injury that might be involved. Um, uh, litigation over silicon breast implants, for example, is a very, very different matter from litigation over alleged uh, employment on the basis of gender discrimination. Okay. Uh, 
and also because there are so many different procedures in the US for handling mass torts. Um, I don't know even if I have them all, but the ones that I know about are consolidated cases, multi-district litigation, bellwether trials, which basically means test cases, class actions. Class actions is what Grissom is, is so cynical about. Okay. Each has its own history, each has its own legal complexities, and already on page three of the paper I feel like I'm drowning. Okay, can't, can't do all that. Um, there are also, I think, very important policy questions about the interactions between the tort system and the regulatory system. You know, what, what responsibilities do we want the FDA or the EPA to take care of, and which are we willing to deal with after the event by the tort system? Um, and then there are all sorts of very hard philosophical questions about, for example, um, how well can individual justice ever be served by mass litigation of this kind? Um, I'm not going to talk about those subjects. I wish I could, but I don't think I would be very good at it, so I won't. I want to pick a relatively modest subject, um, and I have a relatively modest set of theses. There's a bunch of, okay, there, there is a, how to put this? There is a very famous lecture by Sir Austin Bradford Hill on the subject of the environment and disease. The main theme of which is suggestions about how we are to distinguish between an epidemiological association between exposure to some substance, S, and the development of some disease or disorder, D. How are we to tell when such a statistical association is causal and not something else entirely. Um, I don't know how influential this lecture has been elsewhere, but in US courts, Bradford Hill's name is frequently invoked. Um, I suspect that to many of the people who invoke it, he's a mythical figure. I think they know almost nothing about him. Um, and I believe that his ideas have been very badly abused in the US legal system. Um, so what I'm going to do is to start with Bradford Hill's lecture and explain in the epidemiological context what it was he was trying to do and what he takes the standing of his principles to be. Uh, then to tell you something about how these ideas have been invoked in US courtrooms and how horribly they have been misunderstood uh, then to try to put Bradford Hill's ideas against uh, uh, a, a more complicated, at least, and I hope um, better articulated epistemological background, and then to offer some suggestions about why he got so badly misunderstood. Okay. So first, let me start with his lecture. Uh, maybe let me start with Sir Austin Bradford Hill. British uh, medical statistician, very famous. Um, he was Sir, which means he was much honored in his day. Uh, he was actually not trained in medicine and not trained in statistics. His degree was in economics, uh, but he became famous as a medical statistician. He wrote a very important book on medical statistics which went through, I don't know how many editions. It was first published in 1937. And the most recent edition, I believe, was 1991. That's a very long-lived book. If any of my books lives that long, I shall be delighted. Um, okay. Uh, he also gave this famous presidential address to the Occupational Medicine section of the Royal Academy of Medicine in 1965. He had previously done some very important work on the relation between smoking and lung cancer. And this was at the time groundbreaking work. Uh, 
the question he was trying to answer was this. He was largely concerned with occupational exposure to toxins, including chemicals, but also dust and similar bad stuff. And his question was, suppose we know that people who work in this factory, people who live in these circumstances, especially people who work in this factory under these conditions, develop this disease or this disorder more often than those who do not work in such environments. How do we tell whether it's the environment that's causing the disease? That was his question. To which he answers by offering uh, nine now, I don't know what to call them. Nine, um, I will say factors in the course of this lecture. The word he uses is viewpoints, which is kind of awkward, but I know what he means. Um, the legal term would be indicia, I think. I think that's the closest legal expression. But I won't use that one mainly because I feel so uncomfortable about what the singular of indicia is. I suppose it's indicium, but everybody looks at me funny when I say it. I won't say that. I will say factors. Um, I've listed the factors on the handout, but I, I want to explain them a bit more carefully. Uh, the first is the strength of the association. What that means is uh, how much greater than, how much greater is the incidence of this disease or disorder among those exposed to the suspect substance than it is among those not so exposed. That's called the relative risk, or the strength of the association. Um, Hill gives some splendid examples. Um, the best of them is that the relative risk of scrotal cancer among men who worked as chimney sweeps is 200 to 1, so that if you work as a chimney sweep, you're 200 times more likely to get this form of cancer than if you don't. That's a really strong association. The association between smoking and lung cancer is more like 20. Okay. In many of the cases that come to court, the association is more like 2 or less, 1.8 or something. Okay. Secondly, consistency of different studies. What he means by that is um, it's more likely to be causal if there are more studies independent of each other in different circumstances, different times, different authors, different places, which show a similar association. Uh, the specificity of the association, which means it's not just a vague association between, say, dust and lung trouble, but between this kind of dust and this particular form of lung trouble. Temporal precedence, that's to say, the supposed cause must occur before the supposed effect. This is the only unconditional categorical factor that he mentions. Uh, biological gradient or dose response curve means if, if you're exposed to a large dose of the suspect substance, you're more likely to get the disease, then that's a good sign that it's causal. Okay. The less the exposure, the less severe or the less likely the disease, the, more, the larger the dose, the more likely or the more severe the disease. Biological plausibility means, and does this fit in with background biological knowledge about how, for example, exposure to this kind of dust might damage the lungs? Uh, coherence with other biological knowledge means, and any story about how this causes that should not be inconsistent with known facts about human biology. Uh, experiment, this one has proved a huge stumbling block, so I will pause over it a little. Experiment means if you clean up the work site, you get rid of the dust, you get rid of the asbestos, you get rid of whatever it is, does the incidence of the disease or this disorder then fall? That's what it means. Clean up the site, 
does the incidence fall? If you clean up the site and the incidence does not fall, that suggests that it's not really causal. If it does fall, that suggests that it is causal. And lastly, analogy. Are there analogies between the way that this exposure would work to cause this disorder and other known mechanisms? Um, the lecture is very short. It's only about 12 pages of, of printed material. But it's very noticeable that Hill hedges. There are many, many caveats and qualifications. He says over and over, you know, don't, don't take this too, too um, unsubtly. These are viewpoints you might take. This is how you might look at the question, is this correlation causal? But much of his time is taken up with, you know, don't rush to conclusions. Uh, in particular, he makes it very clear that these factors only apply when you already have epidemiological evidence, epidemiological evidence of a positive association between S and D. If you don't have that, this doesn't even get started. Secondly, he never uses the word criteria which is far and away the commonest phrase that's used in court to describe these factors. Um, on the contrary, he insists that there can be no hard and fast rules for inferring causation. He even slightly, I think, overstates this because he knows very well that temporal precedence really is a necessary condition of causation. But he's so keen to say, these are not criteria, this is not a checklist, you have to use discretion in applying it, that he says there can be no hard and fast rules without making an exception for temporal precedence. Uh, and he is, I might add, this, this is something, something of a side thought to my main argument, but I think it's worth noting. He is extremely skeptical about the significance of statistical significance. Um, in fact, he says, I don't understand Americans. Why are Americans so obsessed with statistical significance? What's wrong with them? Uh, you can't even publish a paper in the US without tests of statistical significance. Do they not understand that this is an arbitrary measure? Okay, never mind. All right. I'm going to add some other thoughts, some other caveats. If you look at this list, the first problem that strikes me is it's very hard to individuate these criteria, these, these factors, because um, if you think about it, the strength of the association and what he calls experiments are two sides of the one coin. And consistency and coherence are essentially the same one, same thing, except one stated positively and the other is stated negatively. It must be consistent with known biological facts. That's consistency. It must also be not inconsistent with known biological facts. Well, that's coherence. These are essentially the same thing. So counting these things is very difficult and kind of arbitrary. Um, except for factor number four, temporal precedence, they are all matters of degree, stronger or weaker association, and so on. And Hill tells us practically nothing about how we are to weight these factors. And without that, we have nothing remotely resembling a decision procedure. Okay. So what happens when Bradford Hill comes to court? I don't, he doesn't come to court. He's dead, but his ideas come to court. Well, the first thing I notice is the standard US epidemiology textbook, Ken Rothman's Modern Epidemiology, known sometimes as the Holy Bible of epidemiology, gets all of Hill's caveats exactly right. Um, it's actually a splendid book, but for one major flaw. Um, it's horribly infected with popperism. And since I believe that Karl Popper's philosophy of science is a complete disaster, um, I think that's very unfortunate. But on the subject of the Bradford Hill factors, he is very good. Um, 
Similarly, the 2000 and the 2011 versions of the Federal Reference Manual on Scientific Evidence, which is a big brick of a book um, to help judges handle scientific evidence, also gets right the most important caveat. There are no hard and fast rules. This is not a decision procedure. So I tip my hand to Professor Green, who is responsible for getting this right. Um, so it's really kind of puzzling that when he gets cited in court, all those qualifications immediately, we say in English, they go out the window. Everybody forgets all the qualifications. And what we get instead is the most extraordinary mess of misunderstandings and misapplications. Um, they can't even get his name right. Um, you know, is, is, he, is, he, is, is he Sir... Sir Bradford Hill, is he Sir Austin Bradford Hill, is he Austin Brad is he Bradford Hill with a hyphen? Is he perhaps two people? Like Cock Henley? No. Is he two people? There's even one epidemic expert witness who, I think in order to show how familiar he is with all this, um, describes him as Brad Hill. I think that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I can just imagine what Sir Austin would have said had you called him Brad. But never mind. That's just, this is funny but not important. Um, there seems to be some confusion about how many factors there are. Some expert witnesses say seven, some say nine, some say eight, some say, well, at first there were seven and then he added two. I have no idea what the source of that is. Never mind, these are not important, perhaps. But there are very important misunderstandings. Um, the first of which is that Hill's concept of experiment is often understood as referring to animal studies. That's to say, experiments with the substance on animals. Um, that's not what he meant. It's clearly not what he meant. But because whether or not animal studies are even good enough evidence of causation to be admissible has been an issue in US courts, this misunderstanding is fairly serious. Um, quite often, you find the Hill factors applied in the absence of any epidemiological evidence, which was something that he said you could not do. And if you check what word do expert witnesses and attorneys and courts use to describe these factors, it's just astonishing what you get. Um, the most common by far is criteria. Um, one court even writes, with uppercase letters, sufficiency criteria. Bradford Hill must be turning in his grave when he hears this. Um, many expert witnesses show up and say, well, you know, I've applied the Bradford Hill criteria. Look, um, strength of association, check. Consistency, check. Blur, experiment, check. Check, check, as if it was a simple checklist. And on the other hand, some courts treat this as if this were some arcane procedure and they will dismiss witnesses because they have no formal training in the application of these criteria, as if it were sort of hard mathematics as opposed to the exercise of epidemiological judgment. Uh, another word that's, I think, second most common after criteria is methodology. Um, very sinister word, but also a very significant word uh, because Daubert, the landmark US case on the criteria of the admissibility of scientific testimony, says in part that federal courts or courts in any other jurisdiction that's adopted Daubert should look not to the expert witness's conclusions but to his methodology. Okay. This, they've subsequently backed away from this distinction. But Daubert itself is very firm. You should look to the methodology and not to the conclusions. Uh, the idea being, I take it, that if you look to the conclusions, you're effectively deciding the case. And if you look to the methodology, then there's a reasonable chance that you'll let in experts on both sides. <laughs> 
if they each use acceptable methodology. Of course, one consequence of this is now every expert witness has to have a methodology. My favorite methodology, I think, is that of the tire expert in Kumho Tire, Dennis Carlson, who asked what methodology he, em he employed, replied, oh, visual inspection methodology. This means he looked at the tires. <laughs> Everybody has to have a methodology. Um, what the use of the word methodology to refer to the Bradford Hill factors tells you is that satisfaction of some or all of these criteria, so-called, this methodology, it has often been used as the touchstone of the second, that's, that's to say, the second prong or the second clause of Daubert, which requires that to be admissible, that's to say, for this evidence to be good enough for the jury even to hear it, uh, the court must rule that it's both relevant and reliable. And Bradford Hill is often invoked as a touchstone of reliability. That's why you keep hearing the word methodology. So um, I, won't even, I won't even try to go through the long list of cases that are in the paper. Um, some courts treat satisfaction of some or all of the Bradford Hill factors as sufficient to satisfy Daubert's requirement of evidentiary reliability, and some treat it as necessary for satisfying the reliability clause of Daubert. Okay. Frankly, reading these cases, it's, it's just downright depressing. Um, I want to say in, in English, it's a farrago of depressing misunderstandings. Um, I believe in Spanish I should say, it's a farrago of depressing misunderstandings. It's a word that we have adopted. We, we move the accent as we tend to. Well, all right, so what, what really is the status of these factors? What do they really show? How should they really be used? We know how they're misused. How should they really be used? How would they ideally be used? Well, first of all, I should say something about what I mean by a causal claim. Don't get too excited. This will not be a profound remark. It will not be a definition of cause. I wish. I can't do that. Um, what I mean by a causal claim is a claim to the effect that, in some instances, exposure to S can contribute to the person's developing D. That, of course, doesn't define causal because contribute to is just another word for causes. Uh, but it does enable me to distinguish between general causation, which is what I just characterized, and specific causation in this instance. Uh, I'm taking for granted when I talk about proving call a causal claim in the sense I just explained that what we mean when we talk about proof in the legal context, or degree of proof, in the cases concerned, this will be by a preponderance of the evidence. This is an epistemological concept and not a statistical one. We're not talking mathematical probabilities. We are talking degree of warrant of the claim at issue by the evidence that's presented. And that's the first assumption, which, for which I will not argue. If you ask, you what my, ask me what my arguments are, I'm afraid what you will get is the paper that I gave at this conference last year. But, okay, I'm willing to do that if you ask me. Um, secondly, I'm taking for granted, and not arguing here, the account of warrant that I've been developing over many years, beginning with evidence and inquiry in 1993. Uh, this is an account which, um, okay, of warrant, of warrant is that, that may not be a familiar word to all of you. We have just agreed how to translate it. Aval, if that helps. Okay. Um, by my lights, warrant or aval is a matter of degree. It's not either warranted or not, it's more or less warranted by the evidence. 
Um, the theory that I have developed is not atomistic, that's to say it's not about each piece of evidence individually. It's about the warrant of a claim by the totality of the evidence concerned. And it's not purely formal, that's to say it's not purely a matter of logic, which is why I don't say the word inference very often. It's not syntactic, it's, all, it's worldly. It's about relations between the expressions and the world, and not simply about the logic of the expressions. So, more abbreviations, I'm sorry. The degree of warrant of C, the conclusion, by the evidence, E, according to me, depends on three things. And the three factors are, my three factors are developed using the analogy of the structure of evidence to the structure of a crossword puzzle. I hope, I hope these are familiar to all of you. I tried to say something about this in China. It was a complete disaster. Crossword puzzle? What's that? You all know what a crossword puzzle is. Um, so, how do you tell whether a crossword entry is reasonable? Well, first of all, how well does it fit with the clue and any other entries you've already filled out? My analog, how supportive is the evidence with respect to the proposition in question? Second thing, yes, and how reasonable the, are the entries that it intersects with, independently of the fact that they're consistent with that one? My analog is, how secure are the reasons you give for this claim? independent of the claim itself. You can't count it twice. And then, how much of the crossword have you filled out? You know, when you fill in the last one and it, it all works, then you know you got it right. Okay, how much of the relevant evidence does the evidence presented include? So these are my three determinants of evidential quality. Still with me? Good. I hope so. <laughs> Otherwise I'll have to give last year's paper all over again. Um, evidence, of course, may be positive, that's to say, to some degree, it warrants the conclusion, or negative, that's to say, to some degree, it undermines the conclusion, or neither, in which case, it's irrelevant. Relevance, I want to add, is, of course, a matter of degree. We say highly relevant, somewhat relevant, marginally relevant. It's also, I believe, a material matter and not a logical matter. Um, despite Federal Rule of Evidence 401, which characterizes relevance in a way which is silent on this question, I believe that whether P is relevant to Q depends sometimes on facts about the world. Um, let me give you an example. You're all familiar with the drug, the horrible drug, thalidomide, um, sleeping pill sold in the 1950s and 60s, turned out to cause, if taken by pregnant women, terrible, terrible birth defects. Right, the one of, I think, the worst teratogen ever sold. Uh, one reason why the manufacturers had not conducted, by my lights, responsible tests was. And these were early days, but they had tested this drug on rats, um, including pregnant rats, with no ill effects on the fetuses. So they assumed it was safe for people. They should have known that the tests on the rats were irrelevant. Why? Because you give thalidomide to a human being he or she will fall asleep promptly. You give thalidomide to a rat, and it's running around happily. They never absorb the stuff. Rats cannot absorb the drug, and therefore cannot be damaged by it. Human beings absorb it, therefore it's an effective sleeping pill, and it is also an effective teratogen. Okay. Uh, so, relevance is a matter of fact. Whether the, the rat tests were relevant to the conclusion that this was a good drug for humans depended on facts about rats okay. and their physiology. 
Um, supportiveness, I explain in terms of increment or decrement of explanatory integration. And explanatory integration, I, I explain as depending in part on specificity and in part on fit with a broader explanatory context. Maybe I should say for the record, and I said all this long before I ever read Bradford Hill. So I'm not, it, this is not a setup. This is uh, a conclusion reached independently. So what I take it, Hill is really offering is something like a partial sketch map of a large territory. The large territory is evidence potentially relevant to a causal claim in a, in a case. Um, like, you know, we're, we're in a, an unfamiliar town, you know, a town unfamiliar to you, and you say, how do I get to the post office? And I draw you a little map which says, okay, you know where the gas station is. Well, starting from there, this is what you do. It's a partial sketch map. It's not a complete theory. It's a partial sketch map. Um, I can actually, and no, now I can actually map his factors onto my more complete epistemological map. I have a, an epistemological map with all the streets, most of the streets, named, marked, and so on. Um, a strong association, that's factor number one, and a high degree of specificity, number three, make the original epidemiological study more supportive. Why? Because they rule out alternative explanations, so they increase the explanatoriness of the account. If you combine this with other studies which are consistent with it, or you also have evidence of a strong dose-response relationship, or evidence that if you remove the stuff from the environment, the disorder goes away, if you have a background of relevant biology into which it fits neatly, um, or evidence of a, a coherence or of analogy. Other drugs taken in pregnancy can do this. Other diseases caught in pregnancy can do this. And so That means we have additional evidence which, when combined, is more supportive of the conclusion than the original epidemiological study alone. And while there's nothing in Hill's lecture that I can find about independent security, so you, you understand, um, I can map his factors onto my factors of supportiveness and independent security, but sorry, supportiveness and comprehensiveness. But there is nothing in his paper in 1965 that I can map onto independent security. However, his entire book on medical statistics is precisely about that. How do you tell a good epidemiological study from a poor one? And that's the very thing at issue here. Okay. Um, from which I conclude, I mean, you could have got there by a shorter route, but you know, what can I tell you? I'm an epistemologist, so I take the long way around. Um, Hill was absolutely right. There can be no hard and fast rules for making such an inference. No, it's a matter of judgment. Uh, and how strong you judge the evidence depends in part on your background biological knowledge. And, but for number four, which is a horse of a different color entirely, none of his factors, nor all of his factors together, are necessary or sufficient for a proof of causation. So Hill was right, and the misunderstandings of Hill that we hear in court are indeed epistemological misunderstandings and not just technical, textual misunderstandings of Hill, because he was right. So we're doing it wrong in court a lot more often than we're doing it right. Okay. So why? Why? How does this happen? I take it most, most expert witnesses and most attorneys and most judges are not stupid. How did we get in this mess? Well, they're not completely stupid anyway. Okay. Um, how do we get in this mess? Why is he misunderstood? Well, part of the explanation is very simple. So far as I can tell, almost nobody who ever cites him has ever read him. <laughs> 
Um, and not many of the people who cite him appear even to have read Rothman, because his he gets all the caveats right, or even the Federal Reference Manual, which gets the most important one. Right. But I think there's another reason. And I think that is that there's something about the US legal culture and the US legal structure which sort of systematically tends to distort this kind of work, uh, gets it wrong for reasons of its own. Why? Well, first of all, um, you know, there's, there's a sort of legal penchant for, for simple decision procedures. And expert witnesses are looking for simple decision procedures because they think courts are looking for simple decision procedures, so they turn this into a checklist. Very undesirable, but... Moreover, Hill's work aligns very poorly with the legal requirement of, you know, it has to be a threshold. Either this testimony is admissible or it's not. But reliability is a matter of degree, and the strength of the evidence for causality is a matter of degree. So that the law tends to make sharp distinctions where the truth of the matter is a continuum. And I think this is the most important for the, for the present talk. Um, Daubert imposes a kind of evidentiary atomism because the court is asked to rule with respect to each witness and sometimes with respect to different things that the, the, witness, the expert witness proposes to say. Is it admissible or isn't it? So they are, they're obliged to do this piecemeal. This expert witness, may he be allowed to speak, may he be allowed to speak to this question, to this question, to this question. But the structure of evidence, if I'm right and if Hill's right, is quasi-holistic, and the structure of our handling of expert testimony is atomistic. Uh, and I think that means that courts and the experts who are, after all, tailoring their testimony at the, on the advice of the attorneys who've hired them to the kind of thing that, the, the kind of format that will be effective with the judge, that I think is, has the consequence of inevitably distorting Hill's work. We make it fit the legal way of doing things when really it doesn't, so we have to sort of stretch it and wiggle it, Ooh, I should have done that, to do it. Um, so, uh, Hill's approach, as I see it, is implicitly, as my approach is explicitly, quasi-holistic. It's one reason I think it's good work, Hill's work. Okay. Daubert, however, obliges courts to proceed in a certain sense atomistically, that's to say, to focus on the independent security of each piece of proposed testimony not on the quality of the whole conjury of expert testimony put together. And I believe that this atomism stands in the way of assessing the overall um, consequences of the proposed expert testimony adequately. Um, I, should, I think I should be a little careful here. I'm not saying that the combined effect of a whole bunch of separate pieces of, independent, of, of expert testimony is always and invariably stronger than any of the pieces alone. I'm not saying that. I am saying that sometimes the combined effect of a, connection, a collection of pieces of expert testimony which interlock in the right way can be stronger than any of the pieces individually. And that if you only look at the pieces individually, you will not be able to see when jointly they sustain a conclusion better than any of them would by itself. Um, this is, to say the least, ironic, this conclusion. Because it must be it's nearly 20 years ago now, um, when the question was, should the Supreme Court grant certiorari in Dalbert, 
Kenneth Rothman and a bunch of other epidemiologists put in an amicus brief to the Supreme Court, uh, which contains much good sense, um, and includes the following lines. By focusing on what conclusions, if any, can be reached from any one study, from the trial, from any one study, the trial court in Dalbert forecloses testimony about inferences that can be drawn from the combination of results from many such studies, even when those studies standing alone might not justify such inferences, which is, in short form, exactly what I have been arguing for much of this lecture. So all the more reason, that was nearly 20 years ago, all the more reason to say it again and to say it loud there's something epistemologically perverse about Daubert's evidentiary atomism. Um, something perverse which I think Hill would have spotted immediately and which strikes me very forcibly because it's built into my epistemological theory that the structure of evidence cannot be treated that way. Um, I might say all the more so because not only has it been almost 20 years, but also because Daubert is, as I understand it, now becoming increasingly influential in other jurisdictions. Um, you will have noticed a very untidy footnote at the end of my paper because I am completely incompetent to cite um, many of the cases from the jurisdictions that I'm talking about. But for example, uh, we find Albert in Mexico, we find it in Italy, we find it in England, we find it in Colombia, and I'm sure we find it in other places I don't yet know about. All the more important to say, all right, this is, this is where I plant my flag, uh, whatever its merit, there is something epistemologically perverse about Daubert, namely its evidentiary atoms. Muchas gracias. Okay, thank you, Professor Hack. Now we have 45 minutes for debate. <laughs> Professor Green. Yeah, I know. I, I grant you, of course, that how you handle this in court is in some ways a more difficult question than how you handle this. You know, if, if you're a scientist and you're simply trying to reach a conclusion, uh, for one thing, if you're a scientist and you're simply trying to reach a conclusion, you have an option which is not available in court, namely, let's wait until we know more. Okay. Um, 
I'm not quite as sure as I believe you are um, about what I would think if I were to know um, everything about the testimony on each side, the expert testimony on each side in the Bendectin litigation. I'll tell you why. Um, Dr. Dunn, I grant you, is moderately flaky. <laughs> not, not terribly impressive. Uh, but some of the work that Merrill Dow was producing also strikes me as having significant flaws. Um, for example, um, some of the epidemiological studies, I believe, did not distinguish between, okay, sorry, for the benefit of the rest of you, so we're not having a, a complete, you know, a private conversation. Um, Daubert was one of a whole series of Bendectin cases. Bendectin was a drug prescribed against morning sickness in early pregnancy an effective drug against morning sickness. I believe the only such drug there has ever been, um, which perhaps in part because of panic after the legacy of thalidomide was feared to be a teratogen. Okay. Um, there were many studies which apparently showed that it was not, and nothing much that showed that it was, okay. which is what you just said. Uh, some of the epidemiological studies, though, make me raise my eyebrows because not all of them, for example, distinguish between women who took the drug during the period of pregnancy in which the limbs were forming and women who took it earlier or who took it later. And not all the studies distinguish between American women who could be given Bendectin only with a doctor's prescription and Canadian women who might have bought it over the counter and not known that that was what it was. So I think the evidence on each side had some flaws, at least. Um, but yes, okay, there is a practical problem, I grant you. But that problem could be resolved, I think, if we, if we were to, first of all, clear about, God, may I speak about an epistemological fact? It sounds very strange, but I think it is an epistemological fact. Um, it ought not to be beyond the wit of mankind to explain to a jury that in certain cases, the combination of a bunch of pieces of evidence, none of which would be sufficient by itself to establish a causal claim to the required degree of proof, may do so jointly. But that this is not inevitably the case whenever a plaintiff produces such a contrary of evidence. Only if certain conditions are met. And it should not be impossible to say, at least briefly and roughly, what those conditions are. Okay. And from an epistemological point of view, I think it would be better to do that than to prevent, I understand, it doesn't follow that any bunch of bits of evidence, none of which is sufficient by itself, is sufficient. And it may very well be that the Bendectin plaintiffs were in fact hoping that a, a naive jury would make that inference, which would be a mistake. <laughs> but I would rather that the jury would be allowed to hear all that evidence and be advised it has this combined effect only under certain conditions, namely the following, because then we would be likelier to get it right, I believe. And I think incidentally, uh, by my lights, the evidence in Joyner, which is where this discussion about the combined weight of evidence becomes explicit, it comes to the surface in the form of the, the horribly named faggot fallacy of which General Electric accuses Mr. Joyner's experts. Um, I think that Joyner's experts' testimony does look to me very much like a conjurie of pieces of evidence which you can put together until the cows come home, and it will still be weak evidence. Right? And that's, that seems very clear, because it's, it's such a mess. Okay. So it's not that I think, you know, the mosaic theory as a general theory is false, but the mosaic theory as a partial theory, sometimes this is the case, and this is when, is true, and I don't know why we can't tell jurors that. <laughs>
Hey, Carmen. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. about policing and mm -hmm. atomism. Mm -hmm. In is a standard uh, for uh, admissibility of the expert evidence. How, we, how could we ask for it or to it uh, to be uh, holistic instead of atomism? Because the, uh, the, its work is to uh, the admissibility of uh, uh, evidence, a piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not really a comprehension question. That's more substantive than a comprehensive question. Um, how procedurally might you do this epistemologically better, I think, is the question. Well, um, if the defendants are challenging the plaintiff's expert testimony as not good enough to be admitted under Daubert, right? um, let's assume we're talking a Daubert jurisdiction, otherwise it gets more complicated. Um, the hearing could surely proceed by let's hear what each of the proffered witnesses would propose to say. Right? In, in, you know, in limine we hear this. And we don't simply hear what one of them would say and make a decision about him. We hear what each of them would say and then we make a decision about them. That's how I imagine this proceeding. Okay, quasi holistically. Professor Rosenkrantz. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, uh, I realize I'm left eyed. I look in that direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you said that uh, there is something uh, epistemological, epistemological perverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said uh, that there's something epistemological uh, perverse about the word, but uh, uh, when, I, when I saw f the first cases in Argentina that somehow dared to impose upon uh, expert witnesses uh, the Dover test, uh, I sort of welcomed that. Mm -hmm. and, and you may be still right, okay, but, but the question is whether Dover uh, is also sort of le legally perverse or... or or it's legally speaking a good idea, and, and, and this is the, the idea I have. Uh, it's true that if you, if you have judges that are able to exercise uh, epistemic wisdom, so to speak, uh, you don't need a checklist at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's not uh, usually the case. <laughs> so uh, maybe we had to we had to go atomistic and and have a checklist uh, because it, that's easy to handle. Um, uh, so at the end of the day is, is how much confidence do you have in the epistemic wisdom of your courts? And, and there are not many, many reasons to be... Uh, Terribly optimistic. Right. So, you know, it may, you may be still right. Uh, this, uh, you know, epistemologically, it's, it's, it's nonsense. But legally makes a lot of sense. Well, okay. Um, I'm not a cynic, but I am a cynicist. Okay. Um, cynicism was Charles Percy's word for the philosophical principle that one should look for continuities rather than for sharp distinctions. Um, I think here what we have is a matter of degree. Um, it, it's perfectly clear that what we would ideally like is verdicts that are true as often as possible. Okay. No problem there. The problem is with, yes, but what about, what does as possible, as often as possible, amount to? Right. We always have to choose between getting it perfect, which will take forever and cost a fortune, and getting it good enough which we can do within a reasonable amount of time and at reasonable cost in terms of energy, money, etc. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I believe that precisely such an argument is the best, justifi the best justification that there is of common law exclusionary rules of evidence 
against Bentham's critique of such rules. Right? That's to say, not, you know, Bentham is of course right, in, in, you know, in principle Bentham's right, but in practice we only have limited time, we only have limited resources, so maybe in practice the best way is an, ad, you know, an adversarial system in which each party has the best possible incentives to do the best job it can of finding the evidence one way and finding the, the holes in the evidence in the other direction. That may be a good approximation. So I think an argument about theory versus practice is the correct response to Bentham if you want to offer any kind of defense of exclusionary rules at all. Okay. So I guess what I'm saying about Daubert in particular is that there I am not entirely, it's not that I don't think it might be better than some alternatives. Right? For sure it's better than some alternatives. Right. Um, can I give you an example? Yes, I can. Um, Florida is a fry state. So it doesn't have a rule about expert testimony generally beyond that the expert must be qualified. But it does have a principle about novel scientific testimony, namely that it can be admitted only if it's generally accepted in the field to which it belongs which works in some circumstances, but not in all. Not in particular with respect to forensic scientists who belong to a kind of guild or trade union of mutually supportive people. Right? And I sometimes hear public defenders in Florida saying wistfully, oh, if only this were a Daubert state. It would be so much better because then we could go argue you know, this knife mark testimony is unreliable. Right? Can't do that under Fry. Okay. So I'm not saying Daubert isn't better than some alternatives. Right? Maybe in those circumstances it would be better. I am saying that I, I think it's, first of all, far from perfect. And I hope we could do better without it being unbearably expensive in time and resources. Okay, so the, the practical claim is I don't think it's beyond the wit of mankind to do significantly better epistemologically without making the thing totally impracticable. Um, that, of course, is, is an empirical claim. And, and <laughs> right. um, since it hasn't been tried, I don't have a lot of evidence about its success. Professor Richard Wright. No. Okay, all right. Um, I, I must admit, unlike uh, 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 several people here, you know, Susan and, and, uh, and Mike and, and, and so on, I, haven't, I never have read the actual expert testimony in, uh, in Daubert, uh, but I read the Supreme Court opinion and I read Kosinski on remand. And I have a somewhat different view of, of what Daubert requires I mean, in, even Kaczynski said that, uh, that the testimony didn't work because there was no attempt to explain the methodology of how, the, of how he combined, supposedly, these various different pieces of evidence that were on their own, each seemed insufficient. But they said if, if he would have explained his methodology, and it would kind of, you know, seem to be a scientifically valid, reliable sort of methodology, and it seems to me that it could have been done using, for example, your warrant criteria. You know, to what extent did he talk about the reliability of each study on its own? To what extent did he try and explain that even though each of those had their problems, that there's a way to kind of make a, a good story out of those in combination with other sort of things. So apparently the, the, the problem with the expert testimony of Dorr and Dalbert was that he just didn't explain his methodology at all. And there was nothing precluding, even by Kosinski, uh, who kind of went off first on peer studies, which was irrelevant sort of thing, but the guy said in the end, basically, if he would have presented his methodology and it was, you know, seemed to be a reliable scientific methodology, which is the main thing the Supreme Court talked about, then it could have gone through, it could have been admissible. So I don't think that Daubert is necessarily atomistic in terms of kind of saying you have to focus on each one rather than trying to combine it all in an overview. Uh. But what I think was that there was just a complete failure to try and figure out 
proper criteria of combination and warrant like you've expressed, which I think is a good idea, uh, and, and that's why it failed. Uh, now, maybe I'm wrong on that, but it seems to oh, me okay. that that's what's going on. Okay, let, let me speak a little bit about Kaczynski's ruling. Uh, I should probably explain for the benefit of those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, the Supreme Court in Daubert set the new standard for the admissibility of expert or scientific testimony. Um, but it remanded the case back to the Ninth Circuit for uh, a decision on the Daubert's claim. And Judge Kaczynski, rather than sending the thing further back down, um, argued that um, even under the new standards, the plaintiff's expert testimony would not have been admissible, so there was no point in sending it back to the trial court. Um, he, then ex he then said that, that of the many, the, the several expert witnesses that they proposed to offer, um, most would have to be excluded on grounds of irrelevance um, because they didn't even claim at least a doubling of risk. And Dr. Palmer would have to be excluded on grounds of unreliability because he'd said nothing about what, the, what his methodology was, so there was no way of determining whether it was a reliable methodology. Okay, that's background. Um, I, uh, I agree let, with you can, in can, can I interject? Because mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's not, again, quite right. I don't think. It would, if, uh, that the, he would have sent it back on the, on the, uh, the issue of, of general causation and so forth, except he said you're going to fail on specific causation because you couldn't show yes, more than right, a doubling of risk. Yes, that's right. Because you can't show a doubling of risk. Right. Yes. So it kind of so it so it, he wasn't he wasn't he said actually we would because it, because this fry because the new standard wasn't announced before we would give a chance to the plaintiff to kind of redo this in court underneath the Daubert standard and to try and establish a better methodology that, you know, underneath the Daubert standard, but on the general causation issue, whether it's capable of causing this, which was the main issue you're talking about, I think, right? In here, terms, in yes. Terms, yes, here. But, but, but it's, we're not going to send it back because there's no way they could actually establish specific causation since they can't show a doubling in the risk. Yep. So on, on your issue, they would have sent it back. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, um, I think this ruling is awfully complicated, actually, and uh, not entirely coherent. Um, but what I, what, I'm, what I want to say by way of conclusion to all this is, you, in, in my opinion, for what it's worth, there were reasons for Judge Kaczynski to have sent this further and not to have simply endorsed the summary judgment against the plaintiffs from before. Namely, that the case had been briefed under Fry um, and was now being tried under the new Daubert standard. And there were two things that the plaintiffs' attorneys could have tried to do had they had the opportunity. I'm not saying I believe they would have succeeded, but they could have done two things. One, on the question of specific causation, they could have looked for evidence that Mrs. Dalbert was especially susceptible, in which case they would have had a reply to the doubling of risk argument. And they could have asked Dr. Palmer to explain his methodology and to give them grounds for thinking that it was reliable. Um, in my opinion, that would have been her better upshot, not simply because it would have been more, it would have been better in this instance, but because, and this is in agreement with what you just said, it would have brought to the surface the very epistemological thing that I wish they would do. Yeah, how it fits together. Professor Yusen. Uh, I like very much the metaphor of the uh, crossword puzzle, and I think it's a pity that uh, Far East Asians uh, can't catch it. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's a thing quite at odd with my own uh, crossword puzzle view of uh, the way the human mind works. Mm -hmm. uh, hence, uh, I guess, there is actually something equivalent, because I know it's quite popular in Far East Asia, uh, 
kind of crossword puzzle with numbers that is called Sudoku. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty similar in the mechanics because just in the same way at the beginning you proceed very tentatively and mm, the more you get close to completing the picture you get more confident with the solutions because they are in some ways warranted mm -hmm. by the other mm -hmm. solutions. Thanks. That's okay. Just that. um, let, let me tell you... Okay, I want, I want to... Uh, I think I'm in my anecdotage. Um, <laughs> let me tell you first of all how I first arrived at this analogy. Um, I was on sabbatical in Australia. Um, not for long enough for it to be worth hiring a television. And in the evenings, you know, I've been working hard all day. And I, by the evening I was completely exhausted, I couldn't do anything. And what I would have done at home was slump in front of the television and watch garbage. Um, so in Australia, I slumped in front of, of nothing with the airmail edition of The Guardian and Le Monde and did the crossword puzzle. And I was working on epistemology, um, thinking about the following claim, that coherentism mistakes um, good re a, a vicious circle for good reasoning. And I wanted to reply, no, not all mutual support is a vicious circle. And by day I was struggling to articulate this in the abstract. Right? And then one evening I suddenly looked up from the crossword puzzle and said to my husband, look, it's like a crossword puzzle. There is mutual support among the entries. But that doesn't mean that there is a transcendental proof of the impossibility of doing a crossword puzzle. Of course it doesn't. Okay, that was where it all started. Um, then I wrote Evidence and Inquiry, and I discovered that this analogy had many useful features with respect to the structure of evidence and the determinants of its quality. Okay. Then, subsequently, three years after Evidence and Inquiry appeared, um, somebody wrote to me from the University of Pittsburgh and said, did you know Einstein has this analogy? Hey, oh my God, no. Tell me, where? Where? Um, I guess if you're going to be scooped, there is nobody better to be scooped by than Albert Einstein. And actually it was even better than that because he has three lines. I have a theory, he has three lines. Doing science, he says, is a bit like, it's not like being a writer of fiction. It's more like working on a well-designed word puzzle or number puzzle, yes. And you're, I don't know if you know this, but after evidence and inquiry and after learning about Einstein, in defending science, I wrote about you know, the usefulness of this analogy for understanding the method of science. Uh, because there is no algorithmic method for doing a crossword puzzle, any more than there is for doing science. So this began as a tool that I would reach for when I was doing epistemology and became a kind of pet dog. You know, now every now and then I let, it, I let the analogy take me for a walk to see where it goes. Because it's proven extraordinarily fruitful. Right, so. I'm glad it strikes you as it struck me and continues to strike me as enormously useful, mainly because crosswords have so much, they have so much structure. You know what I mean? They have a whole lot of internal structure and so does evidence. And you can learn so much from this little, anyway, enough. Um, I'm sort of Professor, patting my dog. <laughs> Professor Stapleton. Um, thanks. I, I just have one general comment and then a very niggly little technical point. Um, the general comment is that what's uh, one of the elephants in the room in the United States, at least to a foreigner, is uh, the willingness of experts to stand up and give rubbish testimony. Um, and I don't think it is as in... Um, uh, Mike and Joe's paper, they, they suggest that, that unlike in other legal systems, the, the problem is somehow that it, in the states the parties 
have control over their experts. That's the same in, in the rest of the common law world, as far mm -hmm. as I, I understand it. And, we, and yet we don't have this enormous problem. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, a real story to tell about the lack of professional mm -hmm. re, um, re, esteem factors controlling experts that obviously mm -hmm. are much more willing to give up their professional standing by giving junk testimony than in other legal systems. Um, and it may have something to do with how the volume of litigation in the states, you just need a lot more experts and they're you know, willing to so You're near to the do bottom this. of the barrel, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, do, I think you know, there are a number of elephants in the room here and that's, that's one of them. Um, the, 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 the niggly little point I've got, um, mm. you say in one of your footnotes uh, of something that sounds strange to, to me, uh, I work on causation, you say it's worth noting that in certain cases, plaintiffs may, this is 107, mm -hmm. um, it's worth noting that in certain cases, plaintiffs may be making a claim weaker than S causes D. Mm -hmm. For example, that S accelerates mm -hmm. or promotes D. Mm -hmm. Well, you clearly have a theory of causation more demanding than mm -hmm. the ones I understand okay. the law embraces, because mm -hmm. if something accelerated or promoted an outcome, from what I can see, the law would say that is a causal contribution. Okay, well then I'll grant you that one. Don't let's don't let argue okay. over that. Okay. Let argue yeah, I was interested to know whether yes. you thought there I was, was something of, stronger going on here. I was thinking of people like Mr. Joyner. Um, gets lung cancer at the small cell, no, not small cell lung cancer, gets lung cancer at the age of 37. Um, claims um, against General Electric on the grounds that he was exposed in his work as an electrician to oil contaminated with PCBs, uh, insulating the transformers. Um, had a history of lung cancer in his family and a history of smoking. And I, I took it, perhaps wrongly, that his attorneys were suggesting that, you know, maybe he would have got lung cancer eventually for these other reasons. But he got it so young, in part because he was exposed to this goop. I don't, I don't, I, I, anyway, that was the thought. And it was combined with an epistemological thought, that's to say that the weaker the claim, the less strong the evidence you need to warrant it to a, to a given degree. I think that uh, I think that's the, that will be a problem because I think there are two issues as, that I'm interested in. That is, um, uh, this defendant um, I might want to argue this defendant c caused my meso mm -hmm. here and now when I got it, mm -hmm. but he might come back and say, well, yes, but uh, there are all these innocent fibres out there, and you probably would have got a meso that's some right. other time. That, that's yeah, a different yeah. question. Okay. So the first question is. Did he contribute at all to what I actually got? Yes, okay. And the separate question is, yes. gotcha. how much is the, uh, the claim? Yes. Of, Don't let's niggle over the niggle. That's no. it. Okay. It's an interesting thing yes. that it's come, come through. Let's, let's go to the big this. elephant. <laughs> okay. Um, closest I've ever come to a real discussion of the big elephant was in Canada, um, where I, I spoke at Dalhousie once about, about related topics. And they had said ahead of time, please don't just talk about US cases. So having no excuse because they were in English, I read the leading Canadian cases, which at least then were almost exclusively uh, in criminal cases, uh, where the, the argument, you know, the claim was that some doctor had abused usually children in his care. And this gives a very curious picture of Canada, I must say. You know, not the sort of healthy outdoors Canada that I had in mind, but you know, something quite ugly. And I was kind of puzzled by, you know, this is really interesting. All your leading cases are criminal and, you know, on this topic. And ours are all civil. Ours are tort cases. Why is that? And we had a very interesting discussion about this, of which the conclusion that all my Canadian interlocutors voiced without hesitation was, it's the English rule. Loser pays. Um, and I'm sure that is part of the explanation for very different cultures 
um, were also part of the explanation for the vastly greater bulk of such litigation in the US, um, which probably partly explains at least why some of the expert witnesses, you know, the ones who turn up over and over in a certain class of cases, are essentially professional expert witnesses. They've long ago ceased to be professional scientists. Right. One of them in, in Joyner, I remember, is described as having a staff which includes you know, so many paralegals. Oh, and how many scientific assistants do you have? None. <laughs> so that you have this class of professional expert witnesses who make a very good living this way. And because they can make a very good living this way, don't no longer have to care about the esteem of their colleagues in the relevant science. So I think, this, I think it's partly a matter of sheer volume that changes the, the sociological situation. Um, scientific associations sometimes um, try to, to impose constraints on what their members may do and be in good standing. Um, the most startling example um, is the American Psychiatric Association, which actually kicked out one psychiatrist for his irresponsible testimony in death penalty sentencing hearings in Texas. And I was interested to see that after he was kicked out of the American Psychiatric Association, because he was always willing to say that this person would be dangerous in future, always. Um, after he was kicked out, he continues to testify in the state of Texas, but no longer in death penalty hearings in other cases. So attempts for, by professional associations to get control of this situation have not been very successful so far as I'm aware, which is a pity. We have two more questions and 15 minutes, so okay. make it quick. <laughs> Professor Tarufo. Thank you. Very quickly, <clears throat> just a couple of words about uh, atomism and, uh, and holism. <laughs> On the one, uh, the first point is this. The problem of how to combine pieces of evidence is a traditional problem in the European procedural culture, starting from the Middle Ages. Uh, we have treatises uh, on the circumstantial evidence, the classical treatises, where the problem was just uh, do uh, we consider uh, e each piece of circumstantial evidence separately or do we put it together? Mm -hmm. And the rule was that uh, the whole bunch of circumstantial evidence could have more uh, uh, confirmation, could give more confirmation. So we are dealing, in, uh, at least for Europeans, uh, about uh, traditional piece or thing. We have rules about that in the civil codes in France, in Italy, and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, this is an important problem. Second uh, point, I'm not defending Daubert, but I'm wondering uh, if uh, when I think of combining several pieces of evidence, what, I'm, uh, what do I combine? And uh, this lead, leads me to a remark about uh, some ambiguity in the use of the term holism. Not in your use, but in the general use. Because the holistic perspective in, in the assessment of proof has been uh, proposed also as an explanation of how juries decide oh, yes, about yes. fact. And uh, the aversion, Pennington and Hasty, for instance, essay, is that the, the jurors do not take into account the single pieces of evidence because they take into account the, all what they heard without analyzing, so to say, the specific uh, contribution to each piece of evidence, which seems to me rather different from what you are proposing. Because in order to make the crossword, uh, you need the words. If you don't consider the words, you don't cross anything. Mm -hmm. But this is a, a different way of uh, interpreting the idea of holism. One is to say, well, the jury considers the whole of we don't know 
well what? Mm -hmm. Also because we don't know how the jury uh, works. Okay. Another version of all this is combination, but in order to combine anything, you have first to deal with the single pieces of evidence. If not, you don't have the materials for, for the crossword. Okay. Um, with, with respect to the first point, um, I want to say, first of all, aha, so that shows it's not impossible, right? Um, but also, I want to tell you, a couple of weeks ago, um, I asked my, my law school class, it was a class on scientific evidence, before we got to Joyner, so that they, they thought about it before we read Joyner, um, just, just write me a page before class on the following question. Um, can a bunch of pieces of evidence, none of which would be sufficient by itself to establish a claim and issue to the required degree, do so jointly? And if so, when and why? And if not, why not? And several of the answers I got, and the answers were pretty good on the whole, um, several of them used an analogy close to the one that you just gave. They gave a criminal analogy. That's to say, the evidence of an alibi may be a bit shaky. Um, and the evidence of the, the person's not having sufficient physical strength to have caused this may be, well, we're not 100% sure, but it's unlikely he could have done it. And so on and so on. But you put them all together. This is very good evidence that he didn't do it. So intuitively, um, students can understand this. Right, which is very gratifying to me because my epistemological theory is supposed to be in part descriptive of how we do in fact judge evidence. Um, the word holism is, I, I certainly grant you, like practically every technical term in philosophy, um, horribly ambiguous. One of my students invented a wonderful word for the horribly ambiguous, very ambiguous. <laughs> it's a dreadful mongrel, but it's a nice word. Um, it's very ambiguous. Right? It's one of those words like realism, where you just want to scream. It has so many meanings. Um, that's why I use the phrase articulated holism for my theory, because it's not a sort of blank, featureless holism with no internal structure. And I wanted to add something to your second comment. And that is that one of the, okay, obviously my approach is not probabilistic in the usual sense. And a fortiori, it's not Bayesian. Okay. And I am, of course, not the only non-Bayesian in the world, thank God. Yes, um, I used to think I was and all the, all the others were dead because I only knew about Keynes and, and von Mises and Russell. But now I know I'm not alone. There are others. But some of those who are not Bayesians, like Professor Allen, are actually making a proposal which is not purely epistemological, like mine, but really quite radically revisionary in, a legal, in the legal sense. That's to say they're really proposing a shift in the burden, at least, of civil proof. Right. They're proposing something, I think, quite radical and revisionary. So I need to distinguish myself from you know, the atomistic probabilists on the one side and the revisionary holists on the, on the other. I'm an articulated epistemological holist, which sounds perfectly awful, but I think it's quite a good thing to be. Yeah. Last question, Guadalupe Martinez. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if uh, your worries about this doubter evidentiary role, uh, it's related to the procedural stage in which it takes place. Um, because I am thinking that uh, as, as far as I know, I know little, but as far as I know, uh, I think it's turning more uh, into a sufficiency judgment than an admissibility judgment of the expert testimony. So it's that the stage in the procedure is early for this kind of sufficiency judgment, uh, 
because I, 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 don't, I don't see a problem in being atomistic when you're talking about admissibility, like the, the relevant element, but the reliability, I mean, the ones that Dabar's rule mm -hmm. seems to require, it seems it's more like a sufficiency judgment. It has to do with the, with the procedural stage in which the place is so soon, or, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. If okay. that is... Um, all right, we're going to have part of this discussion, I think, after the next talk. Okay. okay. Um, but on its face, Daubert is about the standards for admissibility, not about the standards for sufficiency. Um, though I think um, it's clear to the naked eye that it involves at least a small shift in responsibility for decisions about the worth of the evidence to the judge from the jury. It's, a, it's moving some of the responsibility that previously would have fallen to the jury, to the court. Um, I, think, I think it matters whether you get this filter epistemologically as good as is feasible. Right? So I think I disagree with your view that it doesn't matter at that level. Because if you look only at the independent security, now I'm using my own jargon, of each piece of the evidence, then inevitably you will filter out evidence which jointly might have been good enough. Okay, that's, that's what's bothering me. Um, you have epidemiological studies. Um, suppose... You know, you look at one epidemiological study and you say, well, you know, it, it didn't distinguish the women who took the drug at this period of pregnancy from the people who took the women who took it at this period. It's not a good study. We kick it. You look at this one, it doesn't distinguish the Canadian women from the American women. Not admissible. Um, you look at these animal studies, well, they used rats and it would have been better to use rabbits or maybe chimpanzees. So you toss it. And it could be, if you omitted it all, the jury could see that it fitted together in the right way to make a strong case. So I am worried at the level of admissibility because if it is deemed inadmissible, the fact finder will never hear it. Now, I grant you, from a civil law perspective, this, this looks very different. Uh, but it looks very different in part because even understanding what Daubert is doing there is harder. Because you know, what are you asking the judge to do? to look at this evidence to decide whether he's going to look at this evidence. Huh? <laughs> okay, so I, I think once we start talking about transplanted Daubert into civil law systems, the situation is considerably more complicated. And I would need to think a lot harder before I was willing to say anything very categorical about it. Yes, it's really, really short, right? Mm -hmm. There are very few common law systems other than the United States that retain a civil jury. Oh, yes, I know. So I know, yes. Even in Canada, it's, very in Canada, it's very different. So yes, I know. Yes. So what we're talking about is the United States um, exceptionally with regard to Okay, yeah, I, you are correct, and I should have said that. Yes. Except, you know, we use juries much less often than you might think by reading the book. Yeah, but yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor Susan Hack. Thank you, everyone, for the interventions. Now we have a coffee break for half an hour. And